Now on BBC One, ever wondered what the stars were doing before they became household names? Just ask Angus Deaton. Before they were famous, the very phrase hangs heavy with echoes of hopes fulfilled but lives dashed. How many young minds that might otherwise have been engaged in a life of honest, benevolent industry have been hijacked by this sham modern-day religion we've labelled fame? Indeed, who really wants fame? Who would start upon this road of fool's gold, knowing that it will lead to money without happiness, reputation without worth, a life of leisure, indulgence and excess, but at a cost of loneliness, spiritual bankruptcy and even insanity? Who amongst us would wish to be famous if they knew the true price? <laughs> Fair enough. To Before They Were Famous, a programme which attempts to scrape away the gold leaf of celebrity and get a glimpse of the Baco foil underneath. <laughs> As you know, much of the archive footage coming your way this evening was hoped by its perpetrators to have been as deeply buried as nuclear waste or William Hague's charisma. <laughs> but uh, no such luck, I'm afraid. Tonight, as the carpenters so prophetically put it, it's yesterday once more. Yes, images dredged up from a phase in stars' careers when the only time they were asked the question, do you have a film out at the moment, was by the bloke behind the counter at their local blockbusters. <laughs> So far, so good, but inevitably, with showbiz kids, we sooner or later have to witness this sort of outrage. <laughs> The chair behind may look pointless, but the idea was that should Melandra tire of being so perky and need to sit down, it was plugged in and ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, even, <laughs> even the mightiest of show business giants had to start somewhere. Uh, for instance, a mere 12 months ago, the Teletubbies were something growing out of a sheep's back in Wales, and of course, <laughs> are to be believed, just 18 inches along from Elton John's hair. <laughs> So, uh, so we're gathered tonight to celebrate the fact that while all fame may be fleeting, it's obscurity that lives forever. Hello. I'm going to demonstrate how PG Tips Big Bags gets the tea you can really taste out into the pot. As you can see, there's so much food inside the big bag that the tea leaves can circulate like mad, letting out their really good tea taste. In a smaller bag, it'd obviously be more restricted. On the other hand, it would be able to see more clearly. PG Tips Big Bags make it easier to get more flavour in the pot. Which means more flavour in the cup! <laughs> While researching tonight's show, we called David Jason to ask him exactly what it was we saw swimming before his eyes in that ad, and he quite properly told us it was the chances of his ever working again. <laughs> but uh, as any young actor will tell you, if a casting director inquires, have you ever played a giant tea bag before, you immediately invent six years you spent at RADA specialising in the human portrayal of hot beverages. <laughs> Beside that, you maintain that you can uh, dance, yodel, conjure, strip, juggle, and weep out of either eye on command. And it's generally then that they say, and, of course, you can sing. I'm waking and longing <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
yes, it's a singing John Wayne, although, unless my ears deceive me, he's apparently been dubbed by a singing John Major. <laughs> <laughs> the poor actress there, clearly wondering if the job is a giant tea bag is still going. <laughs> Well, she certainly steals the acting honours with this line. That was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> now, this one is slightly trickier to place. Spread all over town. Well, the fresh-faced guitarist on the prowl is none other than Derek Thompson, Casualty's own Charlie. <laughs> It's uh, from a little known, and you can see why, British film called Gonks Go Beat. Uh, I would tell you the plot, but having watched it through twice now, I'm not entirely sure there is one. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, now that was much better, wasn't it? In fact, it's wonderful. <laughs> Eddie Boothroyd there. <laughs> An uh, early manifestation. Of course, uh, today, thanks to the rise of boy bands, having a voice like a walnut in a waste disposal is no longer considered a handicap. However, at least all the wannabe warblers in that bunch were sent to stage. In showbiz terms, they'd already arrived, even if in real terms there was no one around when they got there. And the moral being, if you do happen to belly flop with your first chance at the big splash, don't fret. Those who dwell in the showbiz deep end rarely get it right first time. Never have I seen her so pale. Don't look at her. Go on. Go Ah! Oh. Me? <laughs> oh, yeah. No! It won't work again. It won't work again. It works. Hey, it works. Let's see how long it'll stay there. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've got a new series coming up, I know, called Secrets Out, which is right. about unusual hobby. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's, it's my uh, 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 hobby. Oh, your name is anything interesting, Mr. McKinney. No, oh, I. Lord Moorcroft wants me to make a print for his memorial statue. <laughs> <laughs> now, the same way as last time. I was lifting a lump of Portland onto the carving stand that went. Uh, just leaving your hands on the desk. Uh, oh, I'd like you to meet Gerald. Francis, who I believe you were judging, Gerald, uh, yesterday. <laughs> How old are you? Uh, twelve. What is the... Whose is that bird? Uh, it comes from Czechoslovakia, and uh, I don't know the name of the person whose business it is, but... Wouldn't be Marshall Tito's, would it, by any chance? Yes, I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gerald. <laughs> All of us are performers at heart, you know? It's something that you get you kind of doing it all of. Like, I've been dancing ever since I was a little girl, and, and dancing at Fremont High School, and now dancing for the 49ers is... It's just something that's in you, you know? And, and you can't get that feeling anywhere else. And I am a real 49er fan, and I love football. Played as skinheads, an idea they, uh, they began, but in the case of their guitarist Dave Hill, one that nature finished. <laughs> Still, they had exposure of a sort. How much worse it must have been to suffer your apprenticeship on the sidelines as a member of that long-suffering breed, the Extra. These days, Extras are called non-speaking artists, which is a bit like referring to this desk as a non-singing piece of furniture. <laughs> treasure all your lives. First and off I is Penelope Keith, seen here marrying a man who shows us what William Hague might look like if he tried to visit a sex club in disguise. Good luck. Well, I got it. On the it Jack is. Benny show, a former Mr Bond Victoria premieres as an Italian taxi Please driver. Me. Please, will you follow me to the taxi, senor? Say, who's this fellow, Victoria? <laughs> 
He is the most famous opera singer in all Italy. Oh. Usually when he arrives in Rome. Oh, such a commotion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, his character obviously hailing from one of those charming Italian villages just outside Kilmarnock. <laughs> well, what happened? In this uh, unforgivable piece of naval oh. nonsense, Michael Caine is overhearing the fact that the nuclear submarine he's on is about to blow up. One chance in a million, but then it always is. Interestingly, rather than react by running around screaming, good God, the nuclear submarine I'm on is about to blow up, he in fact appears to have nodded off. <laughs> He's even able to keep a blank face during one of the most appalling script clichés of recent years. I'm afraid she's going to blow. Speaking of which, this is Joan Collins. As a teenager, in fact, uh, which should place the clip around 1905. Uh, it's from an information film made by the Coal Board, and indeed Joan does look as if she's attempted to stamp out a small fire. <laughs> But uh, note also some furious work by the bloke operating the table lamp, which is only <laughs> stopped when the small boy has a bit of bother with his build your own Sellafield kit. <laughs> from the same era comes fictional music sensation Ronnie Baker, passing over uh, Beryl Reed, playing the planet's only pension drawing Bobby Soxer. <laughs> uh, we note that news of Ronnie's engagement. I'm getting married. Causes balloons to burst, hearts to break, and Glenda Jackson MP to fall over. <laughs> and so too chariots of fire. And if you thought Glenda was miscast as a groupie, how about Ruby Wax as an Edwardian socialite? <laughs> I'm not required to say anything here in her first job, but boy, has she made up for that since. <laughs> meanwhile, in the real world of sport, a real piece of history. For one of the giggling apprentices running behind Kevin Keegan here is none other than one Alan Shearer. Alan is participating in Kevin's farewell party, an emotional ritual that Kevin likes to go through about once every ten days. <laughs> so, a bunch of humble yet honest beginnings, although none of the soon-to-be millionaires featured there would have to live with the shame that our next bunch of young hopefuls are saddled with. It's a trap that, uh, to my cost, I know only too well. The quick thrill and easy money to be earned as a teenage dolly girl. <laughs> there are hundreds and thousands of girls in the world Joanna Lumley is perhaps the most famous of past renter dollies. Uh, out of dozens of similar clips, we chose this one from the 1966 Bruce Forsyth show. Watch for Bruce's endearing goggle at the rump of one model, then his reaction as he reads the note on her bum saying, we know you're going bald. <laughs> Here's Joanna now. Where obviously the plum spot went to the model behind who had to appear graceful and lug an enormous black dog about the set. <laughs> Next up is now Hollywood power broker Goldie Horn, being professionally wild and carefree on the teen show Hullabaloo. <laughs> The band, incidentally, are Paul Revere and the Raiders, who challenged the Beatles' stranglehold on 60s pop with the simple masterstroke of reintroducing the tri-cornered hat. And lastly, a teenage Ulrika Johnson on a lavishly designed breakfast time set, <laughs> and uh, managing to appear classy despite being asked to stand upon not so much a stage, more the base of a long-vanished wedding cake. <laughs> Sadly, the Dolly Girl's counterpart, male beefcakes, are slightly thinner on the ground. In fact, the best we can do is bring you the extraordinary first screen appearance of a certain quintessential Englishman, Irishman Peter O'Toole. <laughs> it seems the producers of this film noted his blonde hair, finely chiselled jaw and English accent, and immediately they went to work. They dyed his hair, gave him a beard, which only left the problem of his voice. Still, thank God for technology, eh? I am Inti Maniac, and this is my worthless white pico. We're looking for an Eskimo called Inuk. <laughs> Traveling this way with his woman and her mother. See them? Yes, Lawrence of Los Angeles there. <laughs> At the time, he probably couldn't have cared less, and to his credit, he probably still doesn't now. Such trivialities only really come back to haunt you if in later life you desperately want to be seen as a serious artist. So if you have any plans to emerge one day as a tortured genius, it's probably a good idea right now to steer clear of this sort of thing.
Yes, disgracefully hamming it up in a frankly shabby piece of exploitative slapstick is one of the Western world's great intellectuals and Woody Allen. <laughs> Animal lovers keen to see the kangaroo exact revenge for being part of this hokum should enjoy the following. <laughs> uh, that was an era when Woody would do anything once, except perhaps go out with a woman of his own age. <laughs> uh, incidentally, on the same bill, Frank Bruno took on a giant tortoise, although the fight was over before either of them reached the centre of the ring. <laughs> Uh, obviously, if uh, performers could see into the future, they wouldn't make such complete fools of themselves, which is why it's doubly damning that in our next clip, Roger Cook is making a complete fool of himself because he can see into the future. The common cold is one of the more infuriating things the 1970s could well see the end of. A vaccine will be injected through the skin by this frightening looking but really quite painless air gun. <laughs> In the home, a cordless push-button telephone will mean much more freedom of movement. <laughs> the telephone picks up what you say through your jawbone and transmits it to a circuit built into the house itself. <laughs> more freedom in the kitchen, too, with this microwave oven. It uses energy from radio waves to cook a frozen meal to perfection in seconds, without burning or loss of flavour. So Roger Cook there telling us to look forward to the end of the common cold, phones that work through your jawbone and hot and tasty microwave food. <laughs> well, the first two seem feasible. <laughs> Such films, incidentally, are known in the trade as corporates. That is, when a company or corporation pays a professional presenter or Keith Chegwin to deliver a message, <laughs> to, deliver a message to their workforce who watch it politely, little knowing 35 of their number have just been laid off to cover his fee. <laughs> to be fair, for most presenters, a nice, well-paid corporate means the days of fronting idiotic pieces for regional news programmes might soon be gone, if not, thanks to us, forgotten. Hello, how are you? Oh, lovely, sweet, all right. Do you mind if I come and talk to you for television for a little yeah. while? <laughs> yes. I brought you some beer. <laughs> and sandwiches. Oh, isn't that nice of you? Yes. Oh, lovely. Tell me, how long have you lived here? Oh, what two years. Two years? Angela then poses a question she would ask many celebrities over the years. How often do you have a bath? <laughs> in the trough, you. You just get in the trough? <laughs> Here at the parish church of Bow, the rector has put a couple of owls in his church and he hopes that in this way you get rid of his back problem. Well, just one more thing. The owls are stuffed. Well, now, Rector, I can understand you putting a couple of live owls into the church, but what do you uh, stuffed owls going to be? I don't think it'd be very wise to use live owls. They carry a bigger bomb load, I think, than uh, that. <laughs> the whole congregation wearing space-tight suits is at uh, best rather comic and at worst a little grotesque. For many people, going to church is, is really an opportunity to dress up in their Sunday best, isn't it? For a lot of women especially, it's uh, almost a fashion parade on the Sunday. Well, this would be a new form of fashion. Actually, I don't think people do go to church in their Sunday best these days. You know, you're a little bit out of date. Well, petrol shortage or none, there's always one sore way of getting around where you don't need combustible fuel. Apart from a bit of hay, that is. Come on, get... <laughs> A rather dubious finish to a piece on petrol pollution there, made all the more hypocritical as we can plainly see Richard's car parked. <laughs> now, the curious thing about all the presenters in that bunch was that although they looked younger, they somehow stopped short of looking actually young. It's almost <laughs> enough to make you believe that the band of unflappable anchor people who sit at the centre of the TV information web arrived on this planet as adults, fully formed and fully sideburned, <laughs> having been given special dispensation to miss childhood. <laughs> One day, a BBC researcher, researching just how long he can skive off in the store cupboard without being missed, uh, reaches up and takes down a dusty, forgotten tin of film. We were ready for bed early that first evening and full of the usual good intentions for the next morning when we wanted to get off to an early start. But you know how it is when you're on holiday. It was past half past ten when we said goodbye to Mrs McFarlane after one of her enormous breakfasts, complete with homemade bread. Jonathan did his usual job, opening the bonnets. <laughs> and we were ready to start off, although rather later than we'd intended. The Timberbees in their wild teenage years there. 
<laughs> Who would have thought those two crazy boy racers would have grown up to be pillars of the establishment, eh? If we can just see that mean machine of theirs again. <laughs> yes, when Noddy was barred for three years for being pissed at the wheel, we know who he sold the car to. <laughs> For politicians everywhere, the threat of a drilling from David Dimbleby uh, suddenly seems less of an ordeal. If he gets too pompous, simply reach for your hidden tape recorder and make this noise. <coughs> <laughs> or if it's Jeremy Paxman, give him a glimpse of your purple party hat. And one thing it obviously doesn't include is the price of this dog, which is 35 pence. Ten pence more than last year. It doesn't include the cost of the candles, for example, which cost us 40 pence. And it doesn't include the cost of the crackers. Yeah, but don't forget also, it doesn't include the cost of cooking the meal. And electricity and gas have gone up. Electricity, for example, has gone up 80% in the last year. What about your crackers? Yeah, well, these crackers cost us £1.30 for a dozen. We saw some advertised for £5. Aye, aye, aye. A plastic car. <laughs> that cost us, what, about uh, 10 pence? Well, I suppose that's... Inflation. Jeremy, why is a cat longer at night than in the morning? I don't know. Why is a cat longer at night than it is in the morning? Because he's taken in in the morning and let out at night. <laughs> Useful investment of ten pence. And a Merry Christmas to you, Jeremy. <laughs> and uh, now, in the interest of political balance, a genuine attempt on our part to portray the nation's party leaders in an equally and evenly humiliating and disparaging way. It's all right for some of you. <laughs> Half of you won't be here in 30 or 40 years' time. Yes, the notorious William Hague appearance at the 1977 the Tory conference. Oddly, he still quotes this as a shining example of his fiery leadership qualities, completely unaware that in everyone else's eyes, he's in fact making the two Dimbleby brothers look like lost members of the Sex Pistols. <laughs> For some real manly action, we must turn to the youth of Paddy Apocalypse Now Ashdown. Close, 20 yards from the border, 23-year-old Marine Lieutenant Ashdown has local forces as well as Marines under his command. Of course, this is not actually Vietnam. It is, in fact, a surprisingly high turnout at a Liberal rally in the late 70s. Smith, Timothy John, 23,000... <laughs> 23,049. Blair, Anthony Neighbor. Charles Linton, 3,886. <laughs> That's his deposit. Whatever happened to him? Uh, oddly, William Hague apart, uh, the search for film of politicians as children is something of a dead end. So it's a relief that in the rather loftier realms of soap stars and pop singers, we're positively awash with sweet images of them as they were before the moral rot of puberty set in. Why, you can almost see their cheeks shine with the spit from Mummy's hanky. <laughs> Louise of Eternal, <laughs> of St Thomas More's Roman Catholic School Choir, as she was then. <laughs> Similarly, going through the motions, Naomi Campbell, <laughs> performing in what uh, any parents will recognise as one of those evening schools thoughtfully invite mums and dads about twice a year to come and endure. <laughs> odds of such stupefying activity leading to a multi-million dollar career one day are uh, roughly the same as seeing Freddie Starr featuring in a dramatic role. Johnny, Johnny, you should have seen that one! <laughs> <laughs> the firefly, That's you, Johnny, you're the firefly boy. Kick him. <laughs> stop him, Johnny, stop him! Who's the firefly? I wouldn't say, Johnny, not to anyone else. Kick him. <laughs> Honest, Johnny, I wouldn't! Who's the firefly? I don't know. No prizes for spotting a miniature Björk. <laughs> <laughs> Eight-year-old Janet Jackson, already exhibiting a talent equal to her elder brother, as well as a dress sense envied by him. <laughs> Janet! Janet! What do you want? 
course, uh, the earlier you start in the business of show, the more traces you leave of your various guises. Take, for example, the face of Phil Collins. With Phil, we're positively spoilt for choice. He was both this rosy-cheeked lad in a crowd scene from the Beatles' Hard Day's Night, and also this fungus-cheeked rocker on the old grey whistle test. Hold on, haven't we seen this clip before? How often do you have a bar? And so is uh, all flesh corrupted, of course. Sooner or later, the child stars find their minds thinking forbidden thoughts, noticing the world around them and leaving childish ways behind, finally getting up the courage to tell their parents the awful truth. They've accepted a bit part in a commercial. Here's your bottle back. Thank you. You can have it when it's finished. Will you get another one, honey? Yes, I expect so. Now hands that do dishes can feel soft as your face with mild green fairy liquid. Does your life change once a month because of your period? Still using pads? <laughs> Let me tell it to you straight. Tampax can change the way you feel about your period. Tampax tampons protect internally, so you feel cleaner. No pad can do that. Feeling cleaner is more comfortable. Plus, more women use Tampax than any other tampon or pad. Now that's something. Yeah. After yeah. After year. <laughs> Snap, crackle, pop encourages growing children to have a good day. <laughs> Kellogg's Rice Krispies helps give them the energy and nourishment they need, plus three important vitamins. <laughs> now the learning starts you at $288 a month, and you may not even have to spend it. Your housing is free. You get 30 days paid vacation a year. What are you going to do with that $288 every month? Do many American students get diarrhea down here? <laughs> you know what, Mom? A lot of us participated in a test that American doctors ran. A diarrhea test? A scientific clinical test. A real thing. A whole lot of students with diarrhea. The doctors gave our group Pesto Bismol. Good old Pesto Bismol. <laughs> and did it work? <laughs> elegant shave. Rapid shave cologne scent. They asked us to try it out. Got a great fragrance. I may shave more often. You got a shave? You might as well make it interesting. It's a rat's my face is what I deserve. <laughs> Six Schweppes tonics, please. <laughs> Sorry, we're down to the last of the Schweppes. We have these, though. Well, you were here first. You have them. Thanks. on impulse. I'd imagine that if uh, Martin Clunes was to see that, Neil Morrissey would never be able to look him in the eye again. <laughs> you've never met before suddenly gives you flowers. <laughs> that is, if it weren't for this. Back the way we came. All right, all right, we give in. Give in? You drop <laughs> kill him. And Martin Clunes passing a death sentence there with all the menace of Julian Clary ordering his death. Kill them. <laughs> Although uh, doubtless meant to be from the planet Andromeda, I'm afraid the makeup job could only come from planet Earth in the early 1980s. <laughs> Possibly the very worst era in history to commit your fashion statements to tape. And with that in mind, the following scenes may prove disturbing for viewers who are now around the age of 35. The room is swaying, the music's playing.
we last saw it on Razzmatazz. Although it's uh, Lisa Stansfield we're interested in here, it would be nothing short of a national scandal if I let Limal's hair pass uh, without <laughs> remarking that it does indeed look like someone has stuck their hand up a Piccanese's bum and yanked it inside out. Lovely. <laughs> So we're uh, almost right up to date. Um, what have we learned? Is it important what people did before they were famous? Should such surface details be an issue? Does anyone in the final analysis care who we were or where we've been? Does it matter to an actor, say a certain member of the EastEnders cast, for example, that uh, during his emotional deathbed scene at the end of Romeo and Juliet, one of the audience is thinking in the back of their minds, what was that song you used to sing in the Kellogg's Fruit and Fibre ad? <laughs> A round of golf. <laughs> No fun on the golf course near the ledge. But they've had some strange ideas about the breakfast through the years, so I've Kellogg's fruit and fibre brought instead. Crunchy whole wheat flakes and fruit are just the thing. So it's quite the most important thing to bring. <laughs> Hazelnuts, bananas. Raisins, coconuts, sultanas. Now my breakfast's really going with a swing. <laughs> Such a happy chat back then, wasn't it? <laughs> So, uh, who knows which contemporary clips will look just as ludicrous in 15 years' time. I'm naturally expecting my current hairstyle to remain a design classic, but then, uh, as I recall, I thought much the same about this one. This Sunday, every U magazine with the mail on Sunday will contain a special car key. <laughs> Check it to your left. You should start up a brand new Astra. to be one. So this weekend, get you magazine with the mail on Sunday. Tomorrow, you could be driving something rather special. Some people don't know how lucky they are to go bald at 17. <laughs> and we make no apologies for leaving you now, much as we left you last time, with one of our finest, most acclaimed and respected actors asking about on children's television. <laughs> Good night and Merry Christmas. Hello! Oh, Jeremy, how nice of you to drop in. I came for you. How shootable. Follow that. No, I think I'll follow you. Oh, all right. Follow me. Huh? He, he likes, likes to, to hike. <laughs> That's what he likes. Jeeva, it's a grand and healthy light. He hikes the forest. Angus Deaton's back on New Year's Eve with a host of stars for the end of the year show. Next tonight on BBC One Film Adventure with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jamie Lee Curtis, True Lies. I hope this rain keeps up. Why is that? Then it won't come down. <laughs> Good night, Angus. Good night. Good night, Angus. Yeah!